give you a warm welcome to the service this evening. We're going to begin with a hymn. One of the, the most common descriptions of God in the Old Testament is as a rock, this image of God as the rock. And so we're going to sing this hymn as we begin. Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. And we'll stand as we sing this together, please. Beautiful words in this old hymn about knowing God as our rock, knowing him as our refuge. Let's continue our worship now as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that you are the eternal God, that you've been our dwelling place, our refuge, the one that we can turn to, Lord, at all times. And we want to give you thanks that from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And we thank you, Lord, that even as we gather here this evening to worship you, Lord, we are mindful even of our brothers and sisters who aren't able to meet such as this. We're remembering this morning even those who are housebound, those just who aren't able to be with us due to ill health or other circumstance. But Father, we're also mindful of of our brothers and sisters, Lord, even across the world who can't even meet in such liberty even that we have this evening. Father, for those even in other countries that have to even meet in secret, those who maybe don't even have a copy of uh, your word in a language that they can read or understand, Lord, we do want to give you thanks that we have the scriptures. We give you thanks even for the liberty that we have to meet together. But we do pray for those who are even living under persecution. Lord, we pray that you would just give them just enable them to to endure, Lord. Give them, sustain them. Give them that sustaining grace to help them. We pray, Lord, also for those who minister to them as well. Lord, grant them wisdom. Grant them boldness as well. And Lord, as the gospel goes forth, Lord, amongst even those areas, we ask that, Lord, many would be added to the kingdom. And Father, as we are mindful as well, taking place even over this coming incoming week and over this weekend already, even the work of Bangor worldwide. We want to give thanks, Lord, even for the meetings that have already taken place 
And Father, as more will take place even during the week, as as those mission reports will be given by the the missionary speakers, Lord, be be blessed and encouraged. And Father, we pray for all who will come along, that even someone will be challenged either to, not just to pray, but to give or even to go as well. Father, we want to give thanks how many even are on the, the mission field even today as a result of even being challenged at one of these meetings. And Father, we pray you'll bless the committee and we'll pray that you, you'll uh, bless the brother who's even um, preaching in the morning Bible times. Help him in his preparations through your spirit, Lord. Just guide him and he know how, uh, even that help in the study as well as on the pulpit, Lord, help him. And Father, we do pray, Lord, that more laborers would, be, uh, would go into the mission field. Father, the harvest is truly great. We see that even in our own area with so many even moving into these uh, new developments as well too. And Father, we pray that we would see even some even coming along to your church here. Father, help us once again tonight as we meet together. And we give you thanks, Lord, even for the wonderful message of your word. And the great power even of the gospel as well, the power to change, the power to heal even the brokenhearted as well. And power to even make us new creations in Christ Jesus, as you've done in our lives. And so, Father, help us as we meet together, as we seek to praise you and to honour you. Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, continuing in that theme of God as our rock, let's sing this chorus together. Ascribe greatness to our God, the rock. We'll sing this through twice, and we'll just stay seated where we are as we sing this, please. Let's turn to God's word tonight. We're turning to the book of Psalms, Psalm 62, Psalm 62. This morning we finished the second in our series uh, in the life of David. Uh, Tonight I thought I would like to look at a psalm of David written during clearly a difficult period in his life. And we're going to consider what helped and sustained him during that time. The inscription says it's according to Jeduthun, and that name, that's the name of a Levite who, along with Asaph, was responsible for the music and the temple worship. And it could mean that he maybe even either contributed in some way to this uh, psalm, maybe it was the tune. And some even think maybe, maybe something Je- Jeduthun was the tune, actually, they sung it along to. But this is a psalm written out of a difficult experience in David's life. So let's read it together Psalm 62. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. 
He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. How long will all of you attack a man to batter him? Like a leaning wall, a tottering fence. They only plan to thrust him down from his high position. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory, my mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge to us, for us. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are but are a delusion. And the balance as they go up, they are together lighter than a breath. Put no trust in extortion. Set no vain hopes in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God, and that to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love. For you will render to a man according to his work. And may the Lord bless the reading of his word together. David here speaks of the Lord being his salvation. And so we're going to sing of that now. This is, this is that hymn, The Lord is my salvation, hymn by the Gettys. And we'll stand maybe as we, we sing this together.
Before we turn to God's word and just before we pray together, um, a couple of announcements just to remind you. I'm not going to go over all the announcements from this morning, uh, but just a reminder about Tuesday night. Don't forget Bangor Worldwide Zone, so we're encouraging people to, to go to that soon. There's no midweek on Tuesday evening, uh, so you're able to attend the Bangor Worldwide. And also uh, the bulletin is out as well at the back. Don't forget to lift uh, those as well too. And there's also some of the invitations for the kids club as well, if you want to take those and hand them out. So... Uh, these are all announcements, and just even pray for Bangor Worldwide as well, for all those taking part on it as well too. But let's pray together as we turn to God's word once more. Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks for the wonderful book of the Psalms, for how it, it speaks into so many situations in our life. Times of joy, times of sorrow, times when our hearts are heavy, or times even, Lord, when we are even confused about what is happening, Lord, and we, we cry out to you, how these are expressed even in the book of Psalms. And Father, may this Psalm of David, Lord, even speak to our hearts tonight. May it be a source of encouragement even to us. May it be a help for us. And so, Father, it's our desire that it would be you speaking even through this. So, Lord, use your word for its purpose and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So turn your Bibles, please, to Psalm 62. Psalm 62. Here we see the psalmist waiting. The psalmist is going through a period of waiting, and it is a difficult period that he's going through at this circumstance. And waiting is never easy. Uh, the psychologists tell us you're either a type A or a type B personality. Apparently type A personalities can be stress prone, impatient, time conscious people who have difficulty relaxing. Or maybe you're a type B. Type B are those who are more patient, relaxed, easy going, or lack any sort of time urgency. I wonder which one would you categorize yourself as? I can see a few mermen ready at one another, thinking what ones they are. But, you know, we often don't find it easy to wait, do we? Whether that be waiting in a restaurant, and, you know, we've got so used to, to, to queuing, haven't we, over the last, uh, with the pandemic and so on. That was, that was a whole shock to us with uh, having to even queue to go into a supermarket or something. But we get frustrated sometimes during periods of waiting. When maybe it seems to us we, we wonder, is something happening? Or when is something happening? We maybe get frustrated even sometimes if, if things don't happen even in the way we expect it to. Yet this psalm begins with the psalmist and he's, he is waiting on God's deliverance. He is waiting on salvation. And we don't know exactly the circumstance around this. Um, when we talk about salvation, I mean salvation from his enemies. That's what the circumstance that he's going through here. And as you look at this, there's some hints or some clues as to what the situation was. It, it could easily speak of, to be honest, a number of periods in David's life. Some suggest maybe it was talking about um, at a time where, where uh, maybe even uh, King Saul, uh, where he was on the, the run from Saul, um, 
uh, and it also could have been talking about times, I don't personally think that's the, the circumstance behind this, or maybe it was the time when others set themselves up in opposition to David, still from the house of Saul. Remember Abner did that. He appointed a, another king um, as well in opposition to David. Some say maybe that's it. Or maybe it could have been the time when Absalom, his son, tried to seize the throne. But what we know when we see clues to this evening, verses 3 to 4, that people were setting out to attack him and they were even they were plotting against him. But in some ways, I'm kind of glad sometimes that Psalms don't always tell us exactly the circumstance behind it. Because it means we can read it and you know, apply it to our situation as well. I'm sometimes glad that we don't you know, have that. Because we can, if we are on a particular time where we can identify even with this, you know, it's a help to us as well too. And yet despite going through this difficult circumstance that he is obviously going through at this time, what we see is David's confidence in the Lord. David's confidence in a sure refuge. And this is what is known as a, a confidence psalm. It's a psalm that expresses a number of statements of that confidence. And so in this time of difficulty, and the key thing is, where does David look in this time of difficulty? I've called this David's sure refuge. But where does David look for refuge? And his answer is really, he looks to the Lord. The first thing we see in verses 1 to 2 is David's confidence. He says, for God alone, my soul waits in silence. For him comes my salvation. From, from him comes my salvation. And this emphasis, emphasis on God alone is found throughout this psalm. Look at verse 2. He alone is his rock and his salvation. Verse 5, God alone. Verse 6, he only. See, David could have easily put his confidence in maybe the place where he was hiding. Maybe it was... Uh, some kind of mountain fortress where he was hiding. Maybe he could have taken, you know, comfort in that. You know, here's a place where we're up on high where, you know, we'll see the enemy coming. He could have been confident in that. Or he could have been confident in maybe the men who were with him, those mighty men of David who were well-known feared warriors, men who were with him to protect him. But that's not where David placed his confidence. His confidence was in God alone. It's in God alone, he says, my soul waits in silence. And when he says this, in God alone, my soul waits in silence, this isn't just the psalmist saying to himself, you know, just be quiet or be still, settle down. No, the word wait here um, means, to, it means to really rest in expectation and in hope. To rest in expectation and hope. It's speaking of a silence and, and quietness of spirit that comes from a confidence in God. That God will save. Here's David having a confidence in God's power, in God's goodness, in God's wisdom and mercy. David was able to be still. He was able to rest in God, even though he didn't know the outcome of that particular situation. But he says, it's from him. I'm looking to the Lord in this. God is my salvation. And David could have easily, just thinking about if we were in David's circumstance, you know, sometimes when you are in a difficult period, you know, in your life, or maybe you're in an uncertain period, you don't know, maybe you've received that uh, news from the, the doctors or something, and you're, or else you're waiting on results, and you're, and you're wondering, and sometimes your mind can race in those moments, and you're wondering, what if this, what if that? And it can be easy to, you know, to let your, your mind play on you as well, too. You know, David could have been like this with his enemies. He could have easily sat in that place where he was and thought, what if they get me here? Or what if whenever I move to my next place, they're going to come and attack me? What if they do this? Or he could have even tried to form strategies himself. Well, if they do that, I'm going to respond this way. But he didn't. He rested in the Lord. He rested and waited in expectation in him. And what he does is he looks to the Lord and he reflects on who God is. And I think that's a critical thing during difficult periods in, in our life as well. Well, not just during difficult periods, but especially during those times, we need to look to the Lord because in those times where maybe circumstances are changing rapidly in our life, maybe one thing after another has come in our life as well, and we kind of go through that period, you don't know where to turn. It's good for us to look to the Lord and remind ourselves that he is the one who does not change. Even in the midst of that difficult circumstance, he is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
his character has not changed, nor have his purposes. And that's why David says in verse 2, He alone is my rock, my salvation, and my fortress. David's reminding himself of these things. This is who the Lord is to him. Now, what's the point of these different images? As I say at the beginning, through the Old Testament, we find the image of God being likened to a rock. It's one that's come up in other Psalms that we've looked at before. And the image of the rock, it's a picture of both strength and also stability as well too. Uh, Because a a large rock or a mountain, it it can't just be moved. You know, it's stable. It's stable. It's a firm place to to come to rest as well. And, And so David knows God for him is this rock. He's one who won't fail him. He's one who won't disappoint him. What about the the fortress? This image of salvation is is obvious enough, but what about the one of a fortress? The fortress speaks of a a high and lofty place. And most of fortresses were set up high on a a mountain or a hill. And of course, the idea of that was from the fortress, they could see the enemy coming. They They could have that view all around them. And so God is our fortress. The one who we trust to see is high over all. He knows all things. When we're in the midst of that circumstance, though we may not know why that's happened, God does. God alone knows. There's nothing surprises him. No circumstances surprise him. He knows what we face. He knows even our hearts as well. And so when David thinks of these thoughts in verse 2, that he's his rock, he's his salvation, he's his fortress, look at the conclusion he comes to. I shall not be greatly shaken. In other words, the psalmist here says it's not that he's expecting a trouble-free existence. He doesn't say, nothing's going to happen to me. No, David knows the reality. You know, these enemies still could come upon him. But what he knows is that um, his faith in God's going to sustain him. Now, whatever happens, he feels with God, he won't be utterly consumed. You see, David had this confidence. And so can we as well, of course, because of what Christ accomplished for us on the cross. We can have this relationship with God through faith in Christ Jesus, knowing that God is with us in the midst of that time of trouble. And he is our refuge. We can know even calm amidst the storms of life. When David wrote this, you see he's he's facing great pressures. Let's look at his enemies, David's enemies in verses 3 to 4. And we find they're relentless. The enemies are relentless. He asks, how long will you attack a man to batter him? In some translations, this word attack is rendered as imagining mischief. And I think sometimes that makes it seem a little bit more harmless than what it was. But literally, these, he was under threat of physical attack. The Hebrew word behind this means to be set upon. These people were actively seeking to harm him, to destroy him. And he says, you know, he uses this image, how they intend to batter him like a, a leaning wall or a tottering fence. It's a very vivid image of how David is even feeling here. Like a wall that's leaning. A wall that's leaning over, about to fall down. Uh, Or like a rickety fence. A rickety fence can very easily be pushed over. And so maybe if some of their attacks had had landed and he was put upon, you know, maybe the enemy had some victory so far over over David. And, you know, they were were reviewing him as like one about to fall. Of course, now, what they don't know and what David knows is, He's one who says, I'll not be greatly shaken. They think, David, ah, we've got you. We've got you in a vulnerable position. But David knows how he stands before the Lord. And here was people who, in verse 4, we see even some of their tactics. They planned to thrust him down from his, his high position. They wanted to remove him. If this is talking about the king himself, they were seeking to take him from that position. They were even not only opposing him openly, they were also plotting behind his back. Look at the end of verse 4. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. Here were people who were being nice to David's face, and yet were actually really talking about him behind their back. And inwardly they were cursing at him, and they were delighting in uh, their deception. So David, it seems, was being attacked from all sides. These enemies were, were real. This isn't some imagined threat. David was facing these things. He's writing this from this difficult experience, whatever that may be, whatever it was in his life. But though the enemy could threaten, could attack him, tell lies about him, what they could never take away from him was God was his refuge. They could never remove that from him. 
And so what we see is, we've looked at David's confidence, David's enemies, and now we see David's encouragement to himself. Verses 5 to 7. Once more, David encourages himself, and where does he look? He looks to God again. Now, if you take a close look at verses 5 to 6 for a moment, you may be getting a sense of deja vu. And that's good, because you've heard those words before. They're in verses 1 to 2. But if you've had your, your coffee tonight before coming out, you'll maybe notice there's some differences there as well. They're not just the same. You'll see that there's actually really, well, three differences really uh, in these verses. From 1 to 2 compared with verses 5 to 6. Firstly, in verse 1, David had said, It's for God alone that his soul waits in silence. But now he words it a little bit differently in verse 5. He says, For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence. So you might be thinking to yourself, Well, that's a very slight difference, name. And yes, it is a slight difference, but verse 1 was a statement. But verse 5, he's actually saying that as a command. This is David literally talking to himself. He's saying, for God alone, my soul, he's talking to his soul, and he says, wait in silence. Before he was saying, my soul waits in silence. That was a statement. Whereas here now he's saying, he's talking to himself here, talking to his soul, urging him to to wait in silence and expectation from God. You see, the thoughts of the enemy in verses 3 to 4 maybe were threatening to disturb the peace that he felt. And so David once more looks to God. And he stills himself when he looks to God. You know, sometimes we need to do that. Sometimes we need to maybe talk to ourselves in some ways. You know, at the moment, the uh, the European Championships are on uh, TV. And sometimes you see the athletes walking around talking to themselves. Have you ever seen them do this? You know, you maybe whether it be um, uh, maybe someone who's a, a runner, or else maybe someone has uh, had a, a false start in the race and they're having to restart it again. You'll sometimes see them walking around, or else boxers, and they're going, come on, you can do this, you can do this. You know, they're talking to themselves. They're doing that to try and spur themselves on. But David here is not just doing, bringing positive thinking in it. He's not just saying, come on, David, you can do it. David's saying, come on, God is going to do it. David's encouraging himself in the Lord. He's not trying to psych himself up. He's he's reminding himself of the truth of who God is and of all that God is in his life as well. This is something he knows. These truths, and we see them repeated again uh, in verse 5 and verse 6. These same truths. And David is really talking these truths to his heart. And you know, sometimes we need to do that during those difficult circumstances because there's times maybe when, maybe even during times of isolation as well, where Satan sometimes tempts us to doubt. You know, why has God brought you into this situation? Or why does God not uh, change this? Why has this happened? He tries to make you doubt. Yet during those moments, we need to listen to the voice of truth. And that's what David's doing. He's encouraging himself by God's word and by God's character. Look at the end of verse 5. Here's another difference. He says uh, at the end of verse 5, For my hope is from him. Again, if we're doing spot the difference here tonight, the end of verse 1 says, From him comes my salvation. So before it talked about salvation, now it says hope. You see, God wasn't just David's salvation in the present, but he was his hope for the future. He was his hope for the future as well. Why? Because God is still the same. He's still his rock, his salvation, his fortress, and his life is in God's hands. And such is the confidence in the Christian, even in the most difficult of times, even in the face of death, because the Christian does not need to fear death because this will only be the vehicle which will bring us into God's presence. There's a third and final difference too. I wonder if you've seen what the third and final difference. I'll give you a clue. It's at the end of verse 2 and uh, at the end of verse 6 as well. Again, it may seem like a, a slight difference. At the end of verse 2, it says, I shall not be greatly shaken. Whereas here, at the end of verse 6, it says, I shall not be shaken. 
Now, which one of those two is the stronger statement? Is it, I will not be greatly shaken, or I will not be shaken? It's actually the one in verse 6, because it's the more comprehensive of the statements. The other one says, I'll not be greatly shaken. But the other one says, I'll not be shaken, full stop. This is here David encouraging himself in the Lord. And as he's encouraged himself in these powerful truths, these central truths of who God is, his confidence has increased. I'll not be shaken. That's it. I will not be shaken. He wasn't meaning that, you know, he couldn't be be harmed. But what he knew is that he will not be utterly cut off from God. God will not fail him. And no matter what happens, even if the enemy was to take his life, they're not going to separate him from God. See, David's circumstance may have changed over the years, but God didn't. And so, in your life, maybe circumstances have changed in your own life as well too, your own health, your family, your job situation, but God has not changed. And the psalmist says, On God rests my salvation and my glory, in verse 7. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Can you get the sense here of how this confidence in God is increasing? As David encourages himself in the Lord, it's building. God was the rock before, and now he's the mighty rock. He's my glory, my refuge. You know, if this was written during a time when David was king, um, and others were seeking to take the throne, others were seeking to remove David's honor and glory, and yet David recognized that his salvation, his glory, that rests with the Lord. That's in his hands. Just like Joab's statement this morning. It's in it's God's will. He's leaving the matter with the Lord. His salvation, his glory rested with the Lord. His throne, his life depended on him. And he's not just the rock, but the mighty rock. But notice something else through this psalm. Notice it keeps saying, he's mine. He's mine. What a precious thing to be able to say that he is yours. He talks about my rock. My salvation, my fortress. You know, if you're watching this tonight and you're not a Christian, you know, I wonder can you talk with, you can't talk with this confidence that David has. David was one who who knew the Lord. He trusted the Lord. He'd proven the Lord in his life. David knew that he'd walked with God in his life. And so he knew that even if he faced death, he would go through the valley of the shadow of death with God with him. The one who would never fail him. And if you're not a Christian tonight, God wants you to know him. He wants people to have that same confidence that David had. He wants people to know him too. God reveals himself in his word. You know, we're born in our life wanting to go our own way rather than God's. That's our natural inclination. We sin in our thoughts, words, and actions. And that sin only separates us from God. And of course, God sent Jesus, his only son, in order to take the punishment for our sin. He sent him. He he revealed himself even in the person and work of Jesus. And that's through turning from our sin and turning to God and, and trusting in Jesus, believing that he paid the price for our sin that we can be reconciled to God. Whereas sin once separated us, we can be reconciled to him. As we were talking about this morning, whereas we were once enemies with God, we can now be not just friends, but family of God, children of God. We can say he is ours. He is our heavenly father. We can call him mine in the same way that David was able to. David walked with God. But you know what? Here's what we see. David doesn't just encourage himself. We see in verses uh, 8 to 10, he actually encouraged others too. So if David's encouragement to himself was to trust in God, his encouragement to others was, was turn to God. Turn to God. David tells them, trust in him at all times, O people. David's urging them from his own experience. He's, he's proven God in his life and he's never failed him. You know, perhaps the biggest challenge, I think, in these verses is that to trust in him at all times. Meaning trust God, not just in the, in the difficult times, but also even in the good times. Sometimes when things are going well, you know, maybe people don't turn to the Lord or depend on the Lord as they ought to. 
the psalmist is reminding here that he had been through many experiences in life and he'd proven God is faithful. And so he's saying whatever circumstance you're going through, turn to God. And he goes on to say, pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. And this phrase to pour out, right, it's referring even to prayer, to praying to God, urging them to, to pour out what's on your heart before him. And Barnes in his commentary notes that, uh, of this phrase that the idea is that the heart becomes so tender and soft so its feelings and desires flow out as water. Even with all its emotions, wishes, sorrows, troubles, we can pour them all out before God. There's not a trouble he can't relieve, not a danger which he cannot defend. And so we must pour out our hearts before him. That's a wonderful thing to be able to, to pour out your heart to someone. And God, we can pour out our heart before him. And in the pages of the Psalms, don't we find that so often? Because the Psalms, they, they, they do, the Psalms, in the Psalms we find this real open and honest account of, of people's relationship with the Lord. Even during those times of struggle. Even when someone's saying, um, how long, O oh Lord, is this, is this going to happen in, in our life? Or why or has this happened? We find that, that in the Psalms as well. We find even the, where someone struggles even with this, the will of God even in their life as well too. But the important thing is, where do we turn in those circumstances? We turn to God. That's the lessons that the Psalm teaches us. When we pour out our heart before him in prayer, that even honors the Lord when we do that. Because it's showing that prayer is, is showing our dependence on God. And we need to depend on him each day. And he, David here wants to encourage here his, his people with this. He says, trust him at all times. Pour out your heart. God is a refuge for us. He's been a refuge for David. And he wants them to know this refuge as well. But notice, though, how David sees his enemies as well now. Here, David, again, you get this impression he's been encouraged in the Lord. And look how that changes his perspective. Verse 9. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are but a delusion. And the balances they go up with are together lighter than a breath. Those of a low estate, the humble man is, is but a breath. Like a, the word behind that is the same word in Ecclesiastes that's translated as vanity. Or like a vapor. Basically, though the humble man is just like a, a vapor. Those of high estate, the influential, the wealthy, they're but a delusion. In other words, they're, they're not as powerful as they think they are. You know, and to illustrate this, he uses the example of the balances or the scales. Now, I remember my mum used to have in the house uh, one of the sets of the old scales, you know, where you would put the metal weights in, in one side. I think she inherited it from someone. But, uh, you know, you put the metal weights in one side and then what you're measuring in the other. And, of course, the idea is of this, of this scale. And here we have people and uh, even his enemies on one side. But he's saying if you were to weigh these up compared to the Lord, well... You know, all the kings of the earth, even the mightiest of armies, could not outweigh the Lord. The Lord is the greatest one. He is the mightiest. He is the strongest. He is the one who is enduring. All others are but a, a vapor even compared to him. So he's urging them, weigh even these powerful enemies against the Lord. And remember, he is greater. You know, but he's also... Challenging even those of a low estate as well too. You know, and regardless of our standing in life, regardless of our, regardless of our earthly influence or achievements, none of these things can ever save a soul from death, from the consequences of sin. None of these can provide lasting security or support. Not wealth or not any other merit of our own, because only God alone can save. And that's what David is bringing home to our people. God is a refuge for you. He turns to his people and he reminds them, don't trust in riches, whether they're gained by honest means or even dishonest means. Don't trust in extortion, riches gained through oppression. Don't trust in robbery, riches gained through that way. No, don't set your heart on these things. Why? Because these things won't satisfy. These things won't satisfy. 
you know, over the course of um, even coming from a business background, working in IT, you know, you, you see often sometimes there was others even went off and started their own business ventures as well. And, you know, many acquired many things even as a result of that. Some got new cars and new houses, whatever. But that would never satisfy because it was always once they got that new car. Inevitably, in a couple of years, they were thinking, I see they've got a new model out of that. Or else, whether it was the latest, often it was the latest laptop. Our, our work was often like, you know, one of the biggest Amazon delivery handling centers, I think, you know. Because there's people always going, you know, oh, the latest gadgets come out. And of course, no sooner had the latest gadget come out when a couple of months later, oh, they've brought out a new one again. The point is, these things are never going to satisfy. Only God alone will satisfy. You know, for some people, things like success or, or money or position can be the idol in their life. And so the psalmist is urging his people here, trust in God. If riches increase, don't set your heart on them. Set your heart on God. And so David comes to a conclusion. We've seen his confidence. We've seen his enemies. We've seen even his encouragement to himself, and that was to trust in God. We've seen his encouragement to others, for them to also to turn to God. And finally, we see his conclusion. David draws his thoughts to a close in verse 11 to 12. And while in this psalm he's been talking about God, in the last verse he addresses what he says to God himself. Firstly, through verse 11, he says, Once God has spoken, twice I have heard this. Now, what, what, what's David referring to there? And the, the, the commentators differ a little bit, and I was wrestling with it over the last few days as well too. Some say, you know, maybe that's David's repeated message in verses one, uh, 2 to 5 and 6 to 8, these things about God being his rock and his fortress, because he repeats that, doesn't he, twice? Others say, no, this is, this is just an expression. This is something that David has heard often. And the thing is, when David has heard often, and when something's repeated in Scripture, we're to take notice of it. This image of God is our rock. It's one we are to remind ourselves of. And what does David want us to take notice of? And what, do they want, what does he want his people to take notice of? Who God is. Who God is. He's been urging them to turn to God, to look to God. He's your only refuge, your source of salvation. And so he says, look to him, remember who he is. All other things compared to God, all other things are false sources of trust. Because people can fail. Riches can't truly satisfy. Possessions cannot truly meet our needs. No, the conclusion that he's come to and the thing that's been impressed upon him is that power belongs to God. But notice something else. How does God wield the power that he has? He is the sovereign, almighty God. And look at verse 12. To him belongs steadfast love. Can you guess what Hebrew words behind that? We've heard it the last couple of weeks now. This word has said, talking about that steadfast love, he wields that power even with such kindness and it's a loyal love, a love that doesn't change with each passing day, a love that remains the same. And so he says this, Lord, you will render a man according to his work. Now for a man who, like David, who's oppressed in this circumstance, what comfort that gives him. To know that one day those enemies who are telling lies about him, who are plotting about him, well, they receive justice. He'll receive justice. He'll be vindicated. On the day of final judgment, the Bible says, when every idle word that men speak, they'll have to give an account for it. The day when men will appear before Christ as their judge. The Christian knows on that day, we know what Christ has done for us. We know that we don't need to fear that day because the verdict on us has already been pronounced. We are justified. We are justified by faith, declared righteous. We have confessed our sins before God and he declares us righteous because Jesus has paid the debt that we owe. He satisfied God's wrath for us on our behalf. But for those outside of Christ, this, this thought that for you will render a man according to his work is a sober warning. Because on that day, who are they going to trust in? On that day, there's going to be no excuse for those outside of Christ. On that day, the Lord won't want to know what 
their bank balance was or what kind of house they had or, or what position they had in society. That won't matter. The Lord would want to know in that day, what have you done with Christ? What have you done with him? The one who he sent to pay the price for sin. What have you done with the one who he sent to be the way, the living way? The one, the only one through whom we can be reconciled to God. It's a sobering thought, isn't it? That God will, will render to a man according to his work. For us as believers, that's, that's, that's a challenge as well too, that we live for the Lord. For those outside of Christ, that's a sober warning. But David, throughout this psalm, he's been looking to God. He's been reminding us to trust in God alone. And there's that emphasis, God alone. There's no other, you see, can satisfy. There's no other can give perfect rest. There's no other can satisfy. No other source of trust will endure. None other than Christ. He alone has power to save. And so he bids us to come to him. What was the invitation that Jesus himself gave? Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. If we want to find perfect rest, we can only find it in Christ alone. He alone is our hope. He alone is our salvation. In him alone can we find perfect rest. And so I wonder, will you make him your refuge tonight? A Christian, if you're going through a difficult time at this moment, look to God. Remind yourself, talk to yourself of, of these glorious truths. Because in the circumstance, when that circumstance overwhelms us, sometimes we, when we get overwhelmed, you know, if maybe it's lots of phone calls happening about a particular uh, circumstance, and it can be overwhelming. Yet we need to remind ourselves of who God is. Amidst that turbulent time, God does not change. God does not change. He is the one in whom we find our rest. And he alone is the one in whom we have our blessed hope. And so may this word be a, an encouragement and even help to your own heart, even tonight. Thinking of that hope that, that David has and talks about in this psalm, Let's sing that hymn there. There is a hope that burns within my heart that gives me strength for every passing day. And we'll stand as we sing this. Then we'll remain standing as I close in prayer.
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we want to give you thanks for the blessed hope that we have in Christ Jesus. This living hope. And Father, we want to give you thanks that as David could declare you as his rock, his salvation, his fortress. And Father, if we are in Christ, we can say the same thing. That you are ours. And because of this, we will not be shaken. Lord, you are our mighty rock and our refuge is in you. And so, Lord, help us to to trust in you at all times, to pour out our hearts before you. For, Father, you are a refuge for us. And we want to give you thanks, Lord, for, for all that you are, for all that you have done in Christ Jesus. And, Father, we pray that if there are those who are watching this who don't know of you as their Savior, who don't have this confidence that, that David spoke of and that we speak of, pray that they will even come to you tonight and find you as that sure and certain refuge. And so, Lord, continue even to speak even this week ahead. Lord, we don't know even what this week would lay ahead for us in this week, but you alone know. And so, Lord, be committed into your hands. Lord, be with us. And as we leave here tonight, take us to our homes in safety. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm-hmm.